Today, we're back for another instalment in the More Than A Mistress series. We'll be focusing on 17th century adventurer Jane Lane. Though it's contested as to whether or not this lady was a mistress, I believe it's not unlikely, so I'm including her here. Jane is most famously known for the aid she gave a young Charles II in escaping the clutches of his enemies after the Battle of Worcester in 1651. At this time, Jane was a resident in the area and she was likely born sometime in the 1620s to a royalist country family in the West Midlands, the Lanes. Jane has variously been described as handsome and accomplished, with diarist John Evelyn later stating that she was an acute wit. Jane's association with Charles began with her elder brother, Colonel John Lane, who was a royalist military man. The siblings were living together at the time. After the Royalist defeat at the Battle of Worcester, heads were scratched as to the best solution in getting Charles to safety on the continent. It was eventually decided that he would travel with Jane, posing as her servant, William Jackson. Fortunately, Jane had a permit to travel to Bristol to visit her heavily pregnant friend, Ellen Norton, and so the opportunity was seized. Charles later described this episode. I changed my clothes into a little better habit like a serving man, being a kind of grey cloth suit, and the next day Mrs Lane and I took our journey towards Bristol. And I'm just going to point out here that although Jane is referred to as Mrs Lane quite often, this doesn't mean that she was married, it's not in the same context that we'd use it today. It was more of a mark of respect in the 17th century context. So returning to Charles in disguise as a servant, he did require some schooling in how best to comport himself. When Jane was waiting to be helped to mount her horse, Charles had to be reminded by John to aid her. He said, Will, thou must give my sister thy hand. When Charles then carried out the instruction in the wrong way, Jane's mother cried good humouredly apparently, What a goodly horseman my daughter has got to ride before her. In one of those funny twists of fate that history so often presents us with, another Charles Stuart would flee in the aftermath of war with a lady, dressed as her servant, a century later. But that's a story for another time. You can read all about Flora MacDonald and her rescue of Bonnie Prince Charlie in my historical heroines guide on my Instagram. That's also History with Megs. Although they arrived safely at the Norton household, Jane and Charles faced peril quite often on their journey. At one point, a servant recognised Charles and had to be taken into the secret. Thankfully, he was on his side. And sadly, Mrs Norton tragically suffered a miscarriage, which also meant a drastic change of plan for Charles and Jane too. They needed to set off to take Charles to safety, but how could Jane leave her friend in this state? Thankfully, from what I can see, Ellen Norton's household was big enough that she'd have quite a few servants to attend to her without Jane being there. Charles came up with the idea to allow the pair to leave in a proper way. A letter detailing the imminent death of Jane's father and his wish to see her was fabricated in order to get them away. And Jane played a convincing role in this stunt, sobbing at the dinner table upon reading the news. This was crucial because although some of the household were aware of Charles's presence and supported him, there were other servants in the household who seemed to have been hostile towards the Crown. Jane and Charles did get away though and Jane delivered him safely to the Royalist Wyndham family for the next leg of his journey. She made her way back to her brother's residence of Bentley Hall after this. And as we know, and as the Royalists among you'll be pleased to hear, Charles did, of course, make it to the continent. Before long, though, it would be Jane's turn to flee. In the middle of October, the Council of State became aware of the role she'd played in Charles' escape after a prisoner interrogation had revealed her involvement. Stories began to spread about the escapade and the aid that Jane had given Charles and it was decided that she must disguise herself as a peasant in order to travel first to the Isle of Wight before making her way to safety of the exiled court on the continent. It seems likely that her brother John also travelled with her but whatever the case, 200 miles was traversed on foot to reach the port. There are accounts that once Jane reached the continent both Charles and his mother, Henrietta Maria, rushed to meet her this was at the end of 1651. Charles apparently greeted her with, Welcome, my life. Whilst there's not an abundance of evidence regarding the relationship between Jane and Charles, it's been hypothesised that the two enjoyed a romantic one together during and or after the emotionally charged time they spent during Charles's rescue. 
and rumours did abound that the two were lovers. John Finch, a scholar who spent time at the exiled court, wrote in his diary in March 1652, Mrs Lane came to Paris and is called the King's Mistress. Whilst John returned to England to attend their elderly father, Jane remained on the continent and thrived. John Evelyn excitedly wrote of how she came to visit my wife, Mrs Lane, the lady who conveyed the King at his escape from Worcester to the seaside. Here Jane was honoured by Charles before she travelled to attend Mary of Orange, Charles's sister, in The Hague. Jane and Charles remained in touch through letters and would meet whenever Jane attended his sister on visits to his court. Amazingly, we have surviving letters between Charles and Jane, in which it becomes clear that the two were very close. In one, Charles reassures Jane after she's clearly complained of his neglect and the imprisonment of her father and brother in England. He replies, Mrs Lane, I did not think it necessary I should ever have begun a letter to you in chiding, but you give me so just a cause by telling me your fear you are wearing out of my memory that I cannot choose but to tell you I take it very unkindly that after all the obligations I have to you, it is possible for you to suspect I can ever be so wanting to myself as not to remember them on all occasions to your advantage, which I assure you, I shall and hope before long I shall have it in my power to give you testimonies of my kindness to you which I desire. I am very sorry to hear that your father and brother are in prison, but I hope it is of no other score than the general clapping of all persons who wish me well, and I am the more sorry for it. Now it hath hindered you from coming along with my sister that I might have assured you myself how truly I am, your most affectionate friend for Mrs Lane, Charles R. It also becomes clear from later letters that the two discussed current political affairs, with Jane appearing to advise Charles. In one letter, it seems that Jane has remonstrated with Charles for betraying her trust after she has advised him. Here, he attempts to assure her that this was not the case. For that which Mr Boswell is pleased to tell you concerning your giving me good counsel in a letter and my making it public in my bedchamber is not the first lie that he has made, nor will it be the last. For I am certain there was never anything spoken in the bedchamber in my hearing to any such purpose, nor, I am confident, when I was not there. Your cousin will let you know that I have given orders for my picture for you, and if in this or in anything else I can show the sense I have of that I owe you, pray, let me know it, and it shall be done by your most assured and constant friend, Charles R. I was lucky enough to see an actual example of one of these letters on a recent visit to Mosley Old Hall, a National Trust property. This was written in Charles's own hand, and it reads... I have hitherto deferred writing to you in hope to be able to send you somewhat else besides a letter and I believe it troubles me more that I cannot yet do it than it does you. When my fortunes improve you shall be sure to receive a share for it is impossible I can ever forget the great debt I owe you which I hope I shall live to pay in a degree that is worthy of me. In the meantime I am sure all who love me will be very kind to you else I shall never think them so. To your most affectionate friend Charles R. Jane benefited greatly from her rescue of and relationship with Charles in later years too. She was able to return to England and after 1660 she was given a thousand pounds with which to buy a commemorative jewel. Charles also added an income of the same amount per annum as well as a gold watch to be passed down the female line of her family and various other payments and gifts in the following years. These included a portrait of himself, that's referenced in one of the letters, and a lock of his hair. The Lane family were rewarded more generally too. They were permitted to include the three lions of England in their coat of arms, and this also included the specific strawberry roan horse that Charles and Jane had ridden on together with the motto, Guard le Roy, or Protect the King. The restoration period yields another interesting insight into Jane. It was during this time that she commissioned a portrait of herself in which she is shown holding a royal crown with a veil partially obscuring it. The implication, of course, is that she was shielding the king from his enemies. Perhaps even more interesting, though, is the small Latin inscription inserted in the top left-hand corner. Taken from Virgil's Aeneid, it's translated as Thus, thus it pleases me to go into the shadows. Though at first glance this appears as a humble assertion of modest re resignation to a quiet life, the context of the verse may suggest otherwise. The quote comes from the story of Dido and Aeneas. At this point, Dido has stabbed herself and curses Aeneas, her inconstant lover, 
a wandering prince, as Derek Wilson puts it, for leaving her. Could this reference be a criticism from Jane directed at Charles? It's hard to know, but it is interesting to think about, especially given the overt reference to him in the painting with the crown. Whatever Jane's feelings were towards Charles, she went on to marry Sir Clement Fisher in December 1663. He was a man who'd also been involved in the rescue of Charles. This could have been a love match, but it may also just have been pragmatism, and it seems that Jane was really quite a practical person. During Charles's escape, she showed great foresight in sending him boiled walnuts to rub on his skin. This was to, quote, obscure the whiteness associated with gentle living, end quote, in the words of Charles Spencer. As much as Jane was pragmatic, she seems to also have had a taste for the finer things, especially in later years. During this time, she enjoyed a comfortable life of relative luxury, reportedly telling friends that her hands should be her executors, as she enjoyed a lavish lifestyle without worrying about leaving a large estate in her will. She had no children, which must have taken some pressure off in this respect. And Jane did indeed leave no great fortune. When she died in 1689, her estate was valued at being just £10. Jane had lived to reach a fairly decent age by early modern standards and had witnessed some of the most dramatic events of the 17th century. Without her help, Charles might not have made it to the continent at all, and English and British history could have been very different indeed. More than a mistress, Jane was a woman who very possibly changed the course of English history. I hope you've enjoyed learning about Jane as much as I've enjoyed researching her. If you enjoyed this video, please do give a like and a subscribe. It makes a real difference. And don't forget to check out my other socials too. I'm History with Megs on TikTok, Instagram and Facebook. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd recommend reading All the King's Women by Derek Wilson. This is a really interesting book about the mistresses of Charles II and the women he was involved with. Jane gets a fair bit of coverage in that book and she's also mentioned in Charles Spencer's To Catch a King. This is a really interesting book too, all about Charles's escape and I would thoroughly recommend.